Weber and uh, Mick Keller, all of whom have been involved in the development of uh, this program in human animal studies. Uh, I have been involved in uh, consulting with them as a person who is uh, uh, associated with the Animals and Society Institute. So uh, th this uh, is very So, um, you have 
sympathize with me. So let me suggest some modes of experiencing that are not quite empathy and then those that are. Okay, so I'm going to begin sort of at a distance from empathy and move toward a mode of experiencing which I take to be concretely uh, empathy. If you recall a friend who recently had a major surgery and that was how you associated and that was what you experienced when you saw me, that's not empathy, obviously. That's a distraction, that's a displacement. And yet we often hear that response, right? Oh, well, my friend had a similar surgery. You know? okay. I don't want to hear that. I'm, 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 I'm here with my own situation. If you observed and inferred, observed and inferred, that seems to be close to what Elisa is calling cognitive empathy. That to me is not empathy. So you're, you're observing major surgery, all the paraphernalia, limited mobility, and then you inferred, well, that must involve a lot of pain and must be quite disorienting. This to me is not empathy. This is analytic observation, objectifying kind of mode of experiencing. If you felt bad, if you sympathized, that to me is not empathy. Okay? And the philosophical tradition has different kinds of distinctions, but sympathy is feeling for, empathy is feeling with or in. It is not yet feeling evaluatively about it. So you, when you empathize, you're simply with me. You haven't yet said, oh my God, the poor guy, you know. I mean, you, that's that's a, a not a move to sympathy. If you put yourself in the patient's shoes, your friend's shoes, and experience what that situation would be like for you, this is getting close. And what people often think of as empathy, but is vicarious experience, and it's not quite empathy. To me, it's closer to what Elisa described as projective empathy. It, re it remains self-centered. It never really makes the empathic move into the other as other. If you assumed bodily complementarity, this is something that's not been mentioned, but it's a very common response. So if, you, if your response was, let me, let me help you, let me push you along, if you were a caretaker, that's a, that's a common response. So another example, if someone is being aggressive to you, your, the, the response is a bodily complementarity. You're protecting yourself. That's not empathy. Okay. Um, if you had an immediate sense of the pain and distress of the individual in response to their pain, but didn't get a full sense of the world they were experiencing in that distress, you just, I felt your pain. Clinton, right? That's emotional contagion. And that, some people make that part of uh, the early development of, of empathy, but it's not quite full-blown empathy because it's not perspective taking. It's just a raw feeling. And infants have that. You know, they feel the mother's anxiety, but they don't have a sense of, the, of what the, of the world of the anxious mother. Okay, so finally and alternatively, if you had some sense of what I was experiencing in that moment, not only my pain, but also my vulnerability and frustration, my inability to control a part of my body, the shrinkage of my living space, the radical constriction of my world, my sense of the major barriers to my getting back to my life, you were empathizing with me. So now, when we reflect together on that empathic experience, we realize that we can habit, the behavior, the tensions, and more generally the experience, the world as lived, of another individual. That that mode of experience, experiencing is distinguishable from several other modes, and that it is an amazing mode of experience. I think Lisa referred to uh, spectacular, or one of the philosophers used that term. But it is, it is quite amazing, I mean, if you just think about it. Um, Further, we know that that mode is a direct and immediate apprehension that rather than involving reflection, inference, rational or critical function or language, it is tacit, implicit, a bodily sense. The word sense here is helpful. I have a sense of what you are experiencing. I have not yet made it explicit to myself. 
And that is, it is again, and again, it is non-evaluative. Uh, I can use that in, a, in later times for good or for evil. It's not sympathy again. Of course, while we are experiencing what another individual is experiencing, we do not confuse his or her experience with our own. When I empathize, I forget myself, as we do when engaged in a movie or book. However, even the most moving of such engagements, the forgotten or passed over in silence self, is relative, for even in the moment of being with or being in, this temporary identification of observer and target, there is no confusion between self and other. So part of the experience of empathizing is an implicit sense that that is not me. While there is a strong sense of a shared experience and interpersonally of a moment being with a kind of intimacy, there is also a sense of the imperfection of the act, that it is my version that I cannot fully have access to or live in your experience. For I am dependent on my own experience to know yours. I have the necessity to drag my own perspective to engage in yours. While, as we have noted in the empathic moment, we have no sense of checking back, associating, and then attributing or transferring that experience to the target of our empathy, we are necessarily informed by our own past experience. Here, our own surgeries, our own disabilities, or the like. However, in reflection on the empathic moment, we can make explicit that self-other distinction and can clarify the particular ways in which my experience both informed and deformed the empathic moment. So, now I'm going to turn to the main part of the paper. Uh, hopefully, hopefully having confused you about what empathy is. Um, and talk a little bit about the application of this empathy, this ability we have uh, to understand other animals. Uh, I come from Merleau-Ponty, uh, as, as Ralph Acampora does as well. Uh, I'm not a philosopher, but uh, uh, I, I've gleaned what I can and applied it to a more concrete uh, place of phenomenological psychology. So Merleau-Ponty describes how the lived body is the condition for the possibility of our immediate apprehension of the world. In the ordinary course of the living, we do not know objects by inference or representation, but by a direct access to them made possible by the mobility of our body. Through our bodily scheme, we can virtually inhabit an object and know it from its point of view as if it could see. For Merleau-Ponty, the body that inhabits objects does so by carrying with it a rich sense of already being informed by our past experience. The lived body is an open system, an evolving repertoire of the moves made in coming to know the world. I immediately apprehend and become further informed as to which objects are barriers to my passage, a threat to my bodily integrity, but also as climbable, manipulable, approachable, sitable. This bodily inhabitation is also the condition for the possibility of our being with other individuals, of sociality or intersubjectivity. Through the lived body we can inhabit and in fact have an originary inclination to inhabit other individuals' point of view. We can apprehend their intended world. Our sociality is not limited to humans, contemporary cognitive ethology, as well as the writings of early philosophical biologists such as Plessner and Portman have established that non-human animals have and are a point of view. Non-human animals live in a largely pre-linguistic, yet meaningful world which they know through their own lived body. This bodily intelligence is of a phenomenal field of which they are the center of action. Theirs is a practical knowledge, but it is also a social intelligence, a knowing how through which they can establish, monitor, and maintain social relationships. So I summarize here a method for the study of non-human animals based on the possibility of direct apprehension of their lived body and its correlative world as lived. It relies on the possibility of empathizing with the posture, gesture, incipient movements, intentions, and actions of non-human animals through what I term kinesthetic empathy, which I hope is a combination of affective and, uh, what's the other word? Embodied. Thank you. The investigator can accompany another animal's body through the potential mobility of his own. 
As an investigator, I can know their intended world by kinesthetically empathizing with their bodily postures, inclinations, and moves. While the primary investigative posture in the present method is kinesthetic empathy, the method is mixed, and it must be, because we have to provide correctives to our own informed body that helps us to empathize. And so there's two kinds of correctives that I suggest to make the method mixed. The investigator reads relevant texts in both popular and scientific literature to arrive at an interpretation of the social construction of the animal under investigation. The investigator then explicates those. For example, in the present case of a study of an individual dog, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, numerous layers of construction are likely in operation, from the more generic to the more specific. Animal has certain meaning, pet, watchdog in rural Maine, which is the setting of the study. So this task is complicated by the fact that some, that some of the social constructions have truly influenced the experience of the animal, while others have not, and are biases that the investigator must bracket or hold in abeyance because they're deforming the empathic move. Secondly, the investigator must become a biographer of the individual animal or animals under study. Again, the account of the life of the animal might inform both the investigator and the tired of study. For example, several demographics and events inform both my pre-study experience of my dog, Sabaka is his name, his experience, and our relationship. So let me tell you a little bit about Sabaka, and then I'll give you the description of uh, his lived world. At the time of the study, Sabaka was a five-year-old male of mixed breed. He had been in our household since he was about four weeks old, at which time we got him at the local animal shelter that reported finding him abandoned at the local town dump. Three months after he joined us, we obtained a second dog, a female collie mix, probably four years old, also from a shelter. We had decided on two dogs so they would be able to have company for each other. Undoubtedly influenced by the local main practice of keeping a dog outside as a watchdog even in our severe winter, we plan to raise these dogs primarily in an outdoor yard with a run joined a shed in the barn. Elky the Collie adopted Sabaka, and the two were inseparable for about a year. When Elky died from an illness contracted before we acquired her, turned out to be heartbroken. That event changed our relation to Sabaka significantly. As absent his canine companion, his primary abode became our home hearth. A second major event in Sabaka's life in his third year was our absence from the house for a six month period, during which time Sabaka was left with the house sitter. This was traumatic for him and influenced the form of his subsequent attachment to us. Even when informed by consideration of relevant social constructions and biography, kinesthetic empathy does not deliver a perfect repl replica of the experience of the target individual. However, despite the inherent imperfection of empathy, as discussed earlier, in the per perennial issue of anthropomorphism, which we've discussed, we claim that this mixed method can be the basis of a productive research enterprise that can complement findings from more traditional scientific as well as philosophical investigations. The reflective explication of our sense of the experience of another game, animal gained through this mixed method is verifiable in a number of ways. Uh, so here, here I'm, I'm, I'm counting at least his claim that I think he was saying it's not perfectly knowable, but I, I want to say that it's, it's verifiable to some degree in the same way that science is roughly you know, verifiable, but never ending. You always keep going on with further theories of changes and so forth. So there's three ways we can verify. One is through the process of explication itself. As we take our emerging account against our present and ongoing sense of the other's experience. So my account informs how I was experiencing and have a kind of hermeneutic circle here, dialectical process. We also can verify through predictions of behavior generated by the accounts. And I think scientists are very comfortable with using their own empathic understandings and then trying to test them in a more objectifiable way. And through the ability, the third way, through the ability of the accounts to resonate with those of other investigators. So it's an ongoing conversation as to what the world of the dog is. While some scholars have argued that the experience of animals of other species are largely inaccessible to us as investigators, an argument can be made in the other direction. Arguably, despite the now more clearly understood
understood sophistication of their intellectual and social capabilities, the structure of the experience of non-human animals is relatively less complex than that of human beings. Although variable across non-human species, in general there is a relative absence of reflective layerings of intended meanings, of deceits, of social masks. This relative simplicity may compensate for their alleged radical otherness and the absence of full-blown linguistic communication as a window into their experience. So now what follows is a brief example of the method in action. When he's outside, doesn't move. When he's outside, Sabaka spends much of his time lying in a certain spot at the head of the driveway. Thank you. This place allows him an optimal view both down the driveway to the street and through the windows of the kitchen. It also allows him to be in the sun. From this spot, he can comfortably doze while vigilantly smelling, listening, and watching, ready to bark, bay, and half charge at passers by. He also can watch family comings and goings, other places within the house, and offer some of these same features. Under the couch in the playroom, on the second floor landing, and at the threshold between the dining room and the kitchen. Currently, it's not really currently, Sabaka is now gone, but so currently, Sabaka sleeps overnight on the landing, although we had originally intended for him to sleep outside. When Elkie's premature death derailed that plan, slowly Sabaka moved to sleeping arrangements, arrangements close to us in a shed attached to the main house. However, during our six month stay abroad, we instructed the house sitter to let him sleep inside as it was very cold at night. This is Maine, northern United States. And really, we felt guilty at our absence. In retrospect, it is clear that there was a conflicting construction of pet at work here, that of dog as an integral member of the family, vying with the main woodsman construction of outdoor watchdog. It took family absence to give that construction formative power. In any case, Sabaka now sleeps on the landing 12 feet from our bedroom. During the day and early evening when in the house, he stays under the couch to be near us when one of us is on the couch, or to be away from us when he has done something he should not have. When we eat in the dining room, he remains on the threshold of that room, although over the years, almost imperceptibly, that threshold has gotten closer and closer to my soup as the sleeping arrangement has gotten closer to my bed. At most any time of day or night, he may, if given the chance, sleep on a second favorite couch in my study. It would seem that I cannot, or really do not wish to, train him otherwise. While he generally takes a somewhat distant position of surveillance with respect to us, he will quickly, quickly occupy a bedspread or cushion left on the floor, and when curled up to ne next to one of us, will immediately commandeer the apparent choice of the center of the resting place. So, it is apparent that Sabaka lives space in various ways, and through kinesthetically empathizing with him, with his posture, attitude, incipient and actual moves, I can directly apprehend this sense of space. He spends much time seeking and checking on previously established places. As he approaches the prospective place, his bodily posture already begins to assume the contour and as well appreciate the lookout that that prospective place would offer. He begins to circle it and to curl and lower his body. There is more to this than the vestigial, instinctive, grass-flattening or snake-checking behavior of his wolf ancestors. In his bodily attitude, I am aware of his sense of how this space could contain him. He is, as it were, trying it on for size. He is seeking a kind of space which he already knows bodily. It is an optimal resting place that provides a sense of the protection and lookout advantage given by a partial enclosure. It also allows comfort the warmth of the sun or the softness of the carpet. As a vantage point, it is both a lookout or a smelling station for detecting outside threat. And at the same time, it is a place that allows him to keep track of our presence and it gives him a sense of being with or close to us. One of the ways he lives space then is as a space of place, a space of place. Once in that space of place, he lives it in a certain bodily way. He curls his body in the recess for physical warmth and for closeness to the family or pack of which he is a member. He sighs and purrs of discontentment and security, much like he does when petted. While 
often lies oriented to keep watch for both strangers and for the possibility of even more access to the family hearth. But again, it already assumes this posture as a kind of set, as a project of finding such places. More generally, I sense that Sabaka's bodily experience intends objects in the world as sites of possible places for him. He is looking for potential secure places. One way Sabaka lives space is as to be appropriated, as to be incorporated so that it will serve as and become his point of view. He can assume a bodily attitude which intends complex configured objects as to be lived in and lived from as optimal vantage points, as advantages. How am I going for time? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Okay. I'm going to skip that then. Speculatively, I suggest that spatiality may ground the being of Sabaka in a way that it is often claimed that temporality grounds human being. This is not to say that there is not temporal, there are not temporal structures operative in his experience. However, more particularly, I would suggest that place primarily grounds being for Sabaka. He belongs in the place and relates to others from and through that place. He can just lie there for hours because he is not primarily waiting. He is not primarily anticipating. He has already arrived. He is at home. Correlatively, his is a spatial identity. In contrast to a reflective self that is constituted and developed as a unit, unity through and over time, his self is constituted through association with spaces. Sabaka's habitat, that space he inhabits, in, him, in his self, in the sense that while he is in it, it provides his point of view on the world. The space that he has and holds is his appropriated self, in that he cannot disembed or reflect on his position. That self is radically place-dependent. As I have argued elsewhere, many non-human animals are dependent on place, or more generally habitat, to be what they can be. A lion in a cage, rather than in lion country, is not a lion. So now I'm going to turn to the third part of the paper, which is uh, now for something completely different, if you will. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to instruct, teach, counsel people in becoming more empathic. I'm going to skip the piece on mirror neurons. I think that's being covered elsewhere, but there's physiological basis for uh, empathy, uh, both in humans and non-human animals. So, learning and unlearning empathy. Uh, although hardwired for, le for at least the unlockers or precursors of empathy, socialization and education impact both the frequency of use of empathy and, as importantly, the classes of objects in regard to which empathy is applied. Formal education privileges objectivistic and analytic modes of experiencing and, in that sense, might suppress empathy. People learn through socialization those categories in the environment that are considered appropriate objects of empathy, as you indicated. Children empathize with everything at the beginning, or at least have emotional contagion with respect to everything. With respect to animals as appropriate objects of empathy, the task of socialization for a child is complex and daunting as we have constructed many classes of animals, and the distinctions are not intuitively obvious or necessarily coherent. Companion animals, food animals, wild animals, feral animals, pests, game, animal models of human disease, etc. Also, often cultural, subcultural, and familial renderings are at odds. So the, the, the culture might be uh, opposed to fur wearing, and the subculture might be pro, or the subculture might be for hunting, uh, varying influences in the socialization of the child and very difficult to integrate. Finally, there are strong individual differences in the adoption and use of the empathic mode. These, some of these might be constitutional. And failure to use it can impact negatively on the establishment and maintenance of secure and mutually beneficial relationships. So, we have a client. The client is a person who is, has been generally convicted of animal abuse but trying to help them with his animal abuse. So the first thing I need to do is assess his empathy. Uh, what degree of empathy does he have in general? How often does he assume that empathic mode of experience? And typically, not very often. But I also need to assess whether, if he has some empathic uh, 
functioning, whether he includes animals as objects of, of, of empathy, typically not. Sometimes he might empathize with dogs and not cats. And we certainly can make psychoanalytic interpretations of that. So I make this assessment, and then um, I begin to try to teach him or her to empathize. I begin with teaching him or her to learn and identify their own feelings. Then I move to understanding and empathizing with the feelings of others. The first exercise, if you will, begins with emotional contagion. This is just the affective piece without the perspective taken. So this is, um, how do you think he, the dog or person, felt? That dog is really angry. I can just feel it. But that's it. He, he's only got that. He doesn't yet have the perspective of the dog. So then I, I want to, once he's got that, I want to teach him about perspective taking, which is a bit more sophisticated. Tell me more about how he felt. Who do you think he, why do you think he felt that way? Imagine being that individual. Describe what he or she is experiencing at that moment. Describe the experience from his or her point of view. And I work with him to, to, to develop that, uh, that empathic understanding. And sometimes it's faked. Uh, sometimes, particularly, I think the psychopath fakes empathy. So they, they know what it's supposed to be like, but they've inferred it. They haven't made the empathic move. So I have to make that clinical judgment. Finally, once I've got them empathizing, I try to teach them to sympathize, which for me is quite different. How do you feel about him feeling that way? Well, I feel bad the dog is suffering. Well, but you did that to the dog. Well, okay, let's look at that. So I try to, through the empathy, get him to move to a place where he uh, evaluates the experience that he learned through empathy and then evaluates it in a negative or positive way appropriately. And from there, once he sympathizes in a pro-social way, hurting the dog makes me feel bad, the client, I then help him with action, with the way in which he caretakes animals. Okay. So, um, that is most of what I got. Let me just check what I want to say. One more thing here. I think I've said that. I mentioned the possibility that empathy can have, uh, can lead to negative action, again, brainwashing. So in conclusion, in this brief presentation, we hope to have sharpened the experiential referent of empathy as a mode of experiencing, provided a description of the use of a form of empathy, kinesthetic empathy, that is useful in doing research on the animal side of human-animal relationships, and argue that empathy, although in some degree hardwired, can be taught as a skill to people, particularly that population of individuals who have abused animals. Empathy is an amazing phenomenon that provides a royal road both to understanding and being with other beings, both human and non-human. Thank you.